Sophia rises from the plain like the axis of the world, like a clarion bell that calls to wisdom seekers far and wide. Her gentle and sometimes forbidding slopes are home to hermit's hovels, meditation caves, and temples of all sorts. Six temples in particular will be the focus of our pilgrimage today, as they have been for men and women for millennia. Each celebrates and pays honor to a part of speech, not just as grammatical categories, but as philosophies, and not just as ontological elements, but as whole ways of being, whole worlds in themselves. The six temples are dedicated to the noun of philosophy, or being as substance. The pronoun, or being as perspective. The adjectival, or being as appearance. The verbal, or being as process. The adverbial, or being as modal becoming. And the prepositional, or being as relation. The first temple we approach looks like an ancient South Indian structure, huge, ornately carved, its tiered sides teeming with entities of all kinds, with sculpted plant, animal, human, and divine forms bursting out from all angles. As we draw closer, the detail becomes finer, as if the rock walls folded fractally in to tinier and tinier entities. The stonework so fine, you can make out the details of an insect's exoskeleton, a grain of sand, a paramecium. Multi-headed creatures holding various objects guard the arched doorway, and as you step in, the hallway is lined with busy murals, as richly peopled and detailed as Balinese jungle paintings, with statues set in alcoves highlighting elements from the vast scene a crab, a cotton plant, a hawk, a hammer. The hallway opens into a vast chamber with a high ceiling. But even in this great space, the profusion of entities does not relent. They stand about the room in odd arrangements and juxtapositions, seemingly to emphasize each in the uniqueness of its lines, sizes, weight, and form. Flying creatures are suspended on thin wires from the ceiling, which is painted with images of clouds, a rocky moon, asteroids, planets, all receding into an immeasurable Hubble starscape. Standing at the heart of the Nounal Temple, you can't help but notice how the universe has parceled itself out into septillions of islands of integrity, some vast, some tiny, each utterly unique and particular. In this great hall, we stand in awe before the mysterious substance of things, the reality of things. The root of the word reality itself is thing, res meaning thing, matter, property, goods. Look around yourself at all the unique structures and briefly or persistently abiding forms, uncountable in their variety. In some rooms of the Nano Temple, there is a focus on the very small, where some worshippers had thought to find the very substance of substance. You will see all kinds of sacred instruments here, microscopes, lasers, colliders. But in the Great Hall, it is clear that each thing, big or small, is its own substance, its own unique boundary and withdrawn core. David Abrams speaks of the vindication of the mid-range objects. We don't need to look down to the subatomic elements to find the real. We don't need to look out at some enormous cosmic envelope. The real stands here with us also, in the gnarled wood of the overhead beam, the dust suspended in the daylight, the dog or cat at your feet, the bit of star-baked gold glinting on your skin, the raven gargling on your windowsill.
approaching the next temple, the first thing you notice are the great eyes, like the colorful painted eyes of Bodhanat, luminous and piercing. The gaze follows you as you draw nearer, and it takes some effort not to pause and become transfixed under the power of that beholding. At the previous temple, it was easy to forget yourself and become lost in the fascinating swarm of objects and entities. Here, you are more aware of your own movement, your own ascent up the stairs, in the uncertain confrontation with that greater presence. As you slip into the entranceway, there's a moment of relief as you pass out of the range of those eyes. Now you are in a narrow, dark passage that points you to an illuminated space ahead. But crossing the long tunnel and stepping into the light, you find yourself under the gaze of the temple again, this time by a million fold. The vaulted chamber is like an enormous Alex Gray painting with a great ring of dark-eyed icons surrounding you, and painted eyes receding fractally in all directions. One large figure immediately before you seems to see right through you, and you can't help but be drawn in. The motherly statue bends towards you from a great height, beholding you with a gaze both powerful and benevolent. As you approach, you feel your body relax in the space of her receiving, and you see yourself reflected in the polished black pearl pupils of her eyes. Illuminated with her presence, you mutter to yourself, In this thou, there am I, and you abide there for a while. But looking up into her face, you eventually notice the golden, multi-eyed walls rising toward the pinnacle of the chamber where there is a great mirror that takes in all the room. In it, you see not only the teeming eyes which had overwhelmed you, but the intricate carving and the black pearl inlays in the walls, the graceful shapes of the statues, the patterns on the temple floor, and your own body as it lingers before the mother goddess. Standing at the heart of the pronounal temple, you find a curious series of transpositions begin First you are beholding the other, and then you are in the other beholding you. And then in the we of these reversals, you behold what both behold and that just keeps compounding. The confronting walls become the rebounding mutuality of a generative co-presence, eye to eye to eye, and there seems to be no end to what I and we and it may yield. The next temple on our tour of Mount Sophia makes itself known before you even see it. The subtle scent of flowers and incense perfumes the air as you make your way along the trail, and the gentle sound of bells and gongs rings over the ridge tops. Rounding the bend, suddenly you see before you a shimmering, colorful structure, luminous, gauzy, rainbow-hued. It shifts imperceptibly as your angle on it changes now waving with deep indigo flags, now scintillating with sparkling reflections off of the pool of water nearby. Never have you seen something so vibrantly present and yet so mirage-like, so sensuously impactful and yet so like a dream. Approaching it, your skin is cooled by light, perfumed breezes, your ears are tickled by distant metallophones, and your eyes are delighted by swaths of shifting colors that pull you in like a bee to a flower. The temple gate swings open so lightly, you aren't sure it's really there. Passing in, it is like a kaleidoscope has been turned, and there is a shifting of phenomenal forms until a new pattern settles in. The scene resolves onto a great open hall hung with colorful banners. There is a golden jeweled throne at the far end, surrounded by roses and frangipani flowers, on which sits a crowned and silk-draped deity. The regal being gestures at the iridescent walls and the luminous columns, 
at the musical instruments and the tables of food, as if to say, all of this is my self-ornamentation, enjoy. You reach out to touch one of the bowls of fruit, and at first your hand passes through it. Is this then just a dream? You pause and notice the sound of the gongs, slowing your breath to match their rhythm. You reach out again, and this time make contact. The shimmering bowl presents you now with the phenomenon of resistance, and you lift the fruit towards your mouth. You take a bite and savor the bursting juices. Spending the afternoon in the adjectival temple, attuning to the qualities of the great hall, you learn not to expect anything to be there beyond what is phenomenally there. The light touch of the breeze through the windows, the rough texture of the wooden table, the rounded stones of the cobbled floor beneath your feet, the senses of self and deity and object, just layers upon layers of phenomenal profiles, with nothing to grasp beyond the shifting play of perceptions. As you ascend further up the slopes of Mount Sophia, you begin to make out the sound of flowing water. Soon you come upon a stream, and following it, you find yourself before a great opening in the face of the mountain, curtained by a waterfall, with a crystalline pool before the entrance. The only way into the temple is across the water, so you grab a small reed boat that is resting on the shore, and row yourself through the curtain of water into the temple entryway. The hall inside seems both ancient and new, as much a natural cavern as a carved human space, colored lichen, mauve and yellow, turquoise and green, forms shifting murals along the dark walls, both of abstract patterns and pastoral scenes. The turquoise lichen almost obscures several patented pipes that crisscross the room. Flowering vines hug the pillars and drape across the ceiling. And all around the hall, there are exquisitely graceful stone statues and dioceses, and hanging chandelier-like structures that, when more closely inspected, appear glimmering and moist, as if the builders had patiently tended and guided the stalactite and stalagmite formations into these gorgeous forms over many centuries. There is a natural walkway along one of the walls that appears to have been formed at some point by running water. You follow it down deeper into the cavern, and the heat slowly intensifies until your body begins to drip with sweat. You notice that there are little grottos to your left, draped with heavy, worn but ornamented cloths where worshippers may go in and perform purification ceremonies. Eventually the passage leads down to a deep chamber with a molten pool at the center. It bubbles and seethes and hisses out steam. The chamber is almost too hot to enter, so you linger at the door, where you can see the ancient builders have ingeniously channeled the molten material, allowing it to flow off and cool and form much of the great temple that you have been moving through. Retreating from the molten core of the temple, you enter one of the grottos, strip down, offer some prayers, and let the steam burn your body clean. Sitting naked in the womb of the verbal temple, you feel the world is like a living pulse, like a beating heart, like an opening flower, ever in process, ever in motion, even in its stillest stone faces. The next temple on the pilgrimage is near the peak of the mountain, and the ascent there is steep. It has four spires that reach into the sky, though at times, from certain angles, where the thin tips vanish into the blue, it seems as though the spires are ways that the sky instead touches the earth. 
Passing through the tall gates to the temple, you find there is immediately a sharp descent down a long passageway. The stone floor is smooth and a little slippery, so you need to proceed slowly and with care. Along the walls beside you are inset gemstones of many kinds and hues, which seem to filter a subtle prismatic light into the corridor. At the bottom of the long passage, you enter a high vaulted, strangely sloped room. The floor looks almost as if it were made of flowing waves, with four statue-topped dioceses rising up as if they were splashing water drops caught in mid-motion. Each dais sits in a concave bowl in the corner of the room, with the rising drops taking the forms of Aphrodite, goddess of beauty, Aletheia, goddess of truth, Arete, goddess of goodness, and Themis, goddess of justice. They are carved in a fluid, gleaming white stone, with Aphrodite rising naked from her shell, Aletheia holding a hand mirror, Arete placing her hand on her breast, and Themis lifting her golden scales. As you enter the room to circumambulate the statues, you find the slopes compel you to walk in a certain way, finding an optimal distance from each, walking too high on the slope, and you cannot cross over to the next statue, walking too low, and you get stuck at the base. As you practice moving around them and repeating cycles, you find the right rhythms and positions that let you best circle and appreciate each. At the very center of the room, there is a small, deeply sunken, kiva-like chamber with a narrow stone stairway along one of the sides that takes you to the very bottom. After completing your circumambulations of the four goddesses, you make your way to the floor of the inset chamber and find, directly across from you, an opening into another dark passageway. The opening is very small, and you have to get on your hands and knees to enter. As you proceed, the passage gets narrower and narrower until you are forced onto your belly, and the only way through is to undulate like a baby in the birth canal. You cannot do this well unless you deeply relax, so you slow your breathing, and still your body. Eventually, you emerge into a vast seeming, pitch black cavernous space. The room is utterly silent. It is cool, but you feel no breeze moving, perceive no glint of light. The whole space is pregnant with presence. And as your mind and emotions relax and still, you fall into rhythm with the here now togetherness that is the heart of the adverbial temple. The last temple on our tour of Mount Sophia is easy to miss, and some can be forgiven for not even knowing it's there. The entrance is around the other side of the peak from the adverbial temple, between two boulders and under an overhang. Otherwise, there's no discernible temple structure to set it apart from the mountain face. Stepping through the entrance, marked Kora, you find yourself in a small foyer. A modest statue of Hermes is set in an alcove in the wall, and several feet above, the ceiling is draped with a net of glass orbs each at once throwing back the light in little glints and flashes, reflecting the other orbs in the net, and showing the ceiling through their semi-transparent bodies. In the foyer walls are multiple doorways, not all on the same level, but set at various angles and heights, as if you were in the spheric center of a 3D spider's web, and that's indeed what it appears to be. Each door opens onto a long passageway, leading off along different vectors, taking you up along the mountain's highest reaches or down into its depths. From this empty foyer spreads a vast mycelial network of tunnels, many connecting the other temples, others passing around or beneath them along indiscernible trajectories. You choose one of the doorways at random and begin to follow the tunnel, 
tracing its connections. Some of its branches take you towards the temples or through them, and you begin to get a feel for the many relational valences the network affords. How different it is to be above the worshippers or with them, outside the temples or between. Some of the passages are more mercurial, seeming to shuttle you across time. You experience subtle temporal slippages, as though you were beside yourself. A passage you take may open into a duration more than a physical space. It may suspend you between once and until. To be before the temple is not only to confront it, it is to pre-position its concretion, to hover on the horizons of its becoming. Following yet another one of the thousands of meandering branches through the mountain, you suddenly emerge outside again, under the evening sky on the firm earth, standing on a trail you had taken much earlier in the day. You recognize it as the path that had carried you from the pronounal temple to the verbal one, and you realize now that you had been in the prepositional temple from the very start. It is what made the pilgrimage possible. It traces the whole of Mount Sophia, unobtrusive, subtle as light or the tracks of angels, linking world to world to world.